ladies, gentlemen, and disappointments. We are coming to you live from the Woman Caves in New York and Connecticut. My name is Leslie. And my name is Melissa. And we are Verbally Disaster. This podcast is copyrighted through the U.S. Copyright Office as well as the Writers Guild of America. Hello everyone, my name is Leslie M. Jasper and I am the host of the Verbally Disastrous podcast that can be found on over 20 podcast platforms including YouTube. For this episode, I decided to connect with my buddy Brian Reyes who is a traveling journeyman electrician out in California. Every once in a while, Brian and I will catch up and see what's going on. So we recently connected and he shared with me some funny stories. So I invited him to come on as a podcast guest and he agreed. So this is part A on my discussion with Brian about his adventures as a guy who is traveling throughout the 50 states as a union journeyman electrician. Now this podcast episode has been divided into three sections. You have part A, part B, and part C. This is part A and the beginning of the discussion. So head back in to the podcast platform of your choice and look for part A, part B, and part C. I consider Brian to be a really good friend as well as a great co-worker to have the pleasure of working with and a really fun person to talk to socially. So I am looking forward to this discussion. Now let's take a listen to the beginning of the discussion. Let's check it out. Let's start it from the beginning because I was actually doing a testes one, two, one, two. Okay. Welcome, Brian. How are you? Okay. Don't add anything, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to add? <laughs> it makes me sound better than you add it. <laughs> but, if it but if it makes you sound worse, uh, leave it out, right? Leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's subjective, right? I'm on the speakerphone up here in the hills. We don't get much service, so I, I had to go to a good location. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in the hills? You live in the hills, or...? Is well, it I'm the valley? Sure. You know what I'm no. saying? Like a valley girl? Yeah, kind of. You know, I'm, I'm in a, a place called Coors Gold, which is like, um, I'd say about 35, 40 minutes away from the next town, 30 minutes away from Oakhurst, and then from there, it's uh, Yosemite uh, National Park. I'm, I'm just in line. I'm on a route called 41, not too far off of 41, and that's the main route everyone takes into Yosemite. So the next town up is a lot of tourists come through during the summer. Uh, there's Bass Lake, which is not that far from there. It's, it's on the way. This is considered the Sierra Mountain. Sierra Valley area. Oh no shit, so Sierra Nevada is in Hashtag the- not all girls play with dolls. So Sierra Mist, is that nearby, you think? I have no idea. Maybe. I gotta look that one up. This is my six months up here and I'm trying to adapt because I was living at Beach Life, you know, by the bay, by San Francisco, so uh, it's almost going back to New York because there are seasons here now, so. <laughs> Aww. It's a little colder. This is the first time in four years that I've worn a jacket. You know, like a heavy jacket. Oh, look at you. What are we into? We're into December. Yeah. And, and you're just rocking a jacket now? Just rocking a jacket. And be honest with you, by maybe noontime, I won't need it. Just a hoodie is good enough, you know? When the sun is low, it's a little cool. It's cold. Sounds good. Shit. Not, that, not bad. It's still good. Everything's getting green. But the summer times are brutal. You're talking about maybe 110 degrees. Everything is like dried up yellow. No rain. <laughs> it's rough. Wow. Yeah. Put it this way. To go food shopping, you really got to prepare. Okay, I'm going to go food shopping and buy meat. Let's say the closest store is about 30, 45 minutes away. So you got to factor in getting home in time. Forget about buying ice cream unless you got a refrigerator or a cooler in the car. You got to buy some. You got to go to like a little local store. Just bank on it. If you're going to go food shopping, you go food shopping and you come home real quick. <laughs> Get it out of the way. Yeah, or you just throw everything in your front and Nothing in the trunk, everything in the front, and then crank the AC to like max. And hope to God you don't hit traffic. 
Wow. I'm trying to envision because I know I went to Port Wyneme, California. This was back in the 90s when I went for A school. I remember I went there from September to December and we were body surfing in the water in like December. And I thought that was pretty damn cool. Because anywhere else, you'd be like, oh, no, we're not doing that unless you're a polar bear. Right. I didn't get to, to enjoy the summertime. I got to go to Cuba instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> That was okay. Swampville. I'll give you an example. My, my kid, in, in, in my van, I have a van now, Ford Transit. So I have the, the car seat in the back. And my kid left crayon in the cup holder in the car seat. So just to give you an example of how hot it got, all the crayons melted into like a soup in the cup holder. <laughs> Okay? I've never had that happen before, okay? And Did you clean it up? Did you have to discard the whole cup holder? The whole cup holder because it was just like caked in there. It, it was like a flat pancake that was stuck. It amazed me because he was like, Daddy, what's this? What'd you do? I looked and I said, what is it? It was colorful. Like red, blue, and green. I said, those are your crayons. I said, oh man, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But it gets that hot when you leave the car. Because up here, uh, there, there's an area going up to Fresno and, and kind of where I am. There's not that many trees. It's not like you think in Yosemite in the park. So you come down a little bit low where it's like all open land and just cattle and just land for miles. And the sun, that's it. It hits you anywhere you go. <laughs> you can't. Wow. It's hard to hide from it. Yeah, sometimes it's too hot to go to the pool. You can say, I'm going to go chill in the pool. But if there's no cover, you don't want to be the person waiting outside in the pool, hanging out. You just want to be in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in it. And even then, it's like uh, you, you get roasted. <laughs> oh, I, I just remembered I did do a summertime little road trip, and that was 2013. I stayed for my OSHA 510. Did a, No, that was my first one, the OSHA 500. I drove from L.A. Not L.A., LA but I guess like south of it, Carson, like okay. in that area. The temperature in the morning when I checked out of the hotel was like, say, 89 degrees. And I went on the road to get to Vegas. I was watching the temperature gauge. I thought my temperature gauge in the car was broken. It, it went up to 100. 125 degrees it jumped like once they started hitting the mountains i don't know if you know like the main thoroughfare that gets you from la to vegas no i don't know that highway they know what you're talking about and the weather it sounds pretty much right you're correct bakersfield something like that yeah. Oh yeah, that gets hot down there. That's not too far. It's about an hour south of me. Okay, so that's what I was trying to use that as a reference to see if it was held. I asked the guy at the gas station, as soon as I go open the door, all the air felt like it went woof, disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> and I asked the guy, how hot does it get? And he told me a uh, 135 degrees or something. It was in 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm thinking, yeah. how the hell, what do you guys do? And they're like, oh, well, well, we stay in the house. That's not comfortable. It, it's true. It's rough. And in the winter, like I said, the summertime was hard. That area and a little bit lower, like um, where we are living now, though, we bought the house from the guy. Uh, the guy came back to drop something off one day, and he's living in that area. He's actually a little bit south. I think he's living in the Palm Springs area. And it was like 110. He we came up here. He was like, oh, man, it's nice up here. He says, where I'm at, it's like 120-something, 125, 125. I was like, I said, damn, why'd you move there? Yeah, like, why? Why you do that? <laughs> but, Are you part you know, reptilian or something? I know. You must love that because, man, I, I, I know that I can't do another summer up here. This was rough. I where I was living at before, though, that was beautiful. That was, uh, I was on the beach. I was off the Pacific Coast Highway. I was living on a cliff off the beach, and that was great weather. I'm talking. It was a pleasure going home every day. I mean, just, just my ride home, I would come over this mountain, over this hill on, it was a highway called 280, one of their main highways. Every day felt like when you go into a vacation into the beach, and you, you get to the area, and you, and you see the beach ahead, it just felt like that every day. But the thing is, I was going home, you know? So it was wow. nice. It well, was yeah, it's a, the, by the ocean, it's always cooler. I grew yeah. up from kind of where you are, roughly. You go up right. the southern Oregon coast. I was born and raised in Coos Bay, North Bend. So That's the weather right. is like, yeah, it's a lot milder. But what what would you guess uh, from you? How long would be the road trip? Probably like 13 hours? Probably. From Oregon? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that. I'd say that. Because I was going to Bend, Oregon, but inland more. Um yeah, it took me around, uh, I'd say from Pacifica to there was nine hours. So tack on another three. So I'm about three hours from Pacifica now. So 
All right, so uh, now to give the audience an idea of where you started, where were you born and raised, and then how did you get your ass over in California to go tramping? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born and raised in the Bronx, New York, back in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it all started, you know? The baby um, years. You learned from the Bronx. You learned how to uh, break dance early, right? Pretty much. That was my livelihood <laughs> until I found electrical. <laughs> <laughs> Did it save your life? <laughs> uh, pretty much, yes. It got me out of the rough streets of the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say it was interesting. Uh, the, the Bronx, I mean, uh, the Bronx has its reputation, obviously. In certain parts where I went to learn the electrical trade was in the South Bronx. Uh, that was a rough area. Um, Third Avenue, not too far, is Alfred E. Smith High School. Um, some of your friends came from there. Mike Doyle, yep. you know, Dan Bowman, all those guys. Um, and I went to school with them. But yeah, I learned the trade there. I got involved with the SCA program, which is in Manhattan, Queens at the time, I think. What is yeah. the SCA program? The School Construction Authority. I think okay. you're familiar. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because there's people who are listening and they don't know what it means. Oh, That's why. Yeah, Russian Authority. So what it was was a program, and at the time it was giving the inner city vocational kids uh, opportunity to get into the unions. Um, and this was back in the 90s, uh, probably like 95, 96, maybe, 97, I joined them. We went, and it was all trades because they had, uh, in my high school, there was electricians, uh, voc um, carpenters, and engineers. We all got a chance to go to this, whoever chose to, and we got to go and work together. And that was the whole thing. It was like putting us together, teamwork. We had trips on boats, and we had to figure out how to work together to work a sailboat uh, by the South Street Seaport. And we stayed overnight on water. We learned how to cook together. So it was just all like teamwork. Sounds very good. Like That sounds like a better experience than uh, I had as a kid. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice. I mean, we'd go to Manhattan. They'd give us uh, like tasks to do, like find certain things in, in Manhattan randomly. And just we had to go find them, <laughs> uh, search for them. So it was, <laughs> it was cool. And we got to know each other as a school, you know, just from all the different trades. Actually, you get to sign what you want as far as what trades you want to go to. So I chose electrical, operating engineer, and plumbing, I think. You get to choose three. The delegates from each local have involvement in this. So they get to see and they'll know who's there and whoever gives you a call. So when I graduated, um, about six months later, I got a call from a local three. Actually, how it went down was a friend of mine, uh, one of the teachers in high school, um, somebody from local three north and said hey anybody wants to sign uh and put your uh, job application in for local three north so whoever did it did it you very know, good they, a lot of people didn't want to because at the time it was like 35 or 40 bucks so my father was like you better do it he gave me the money and yep. i signed and you guys did it then six months later andy white calls me and gets me in very nice and a lot of the other guys i was in high school with they waited about two years to get in to the city wow so that's Worked out, so I lucked out. I was uh, two years ahead of everybody. I was like 18 years old on 19 already in the program, so it was good. It was nice, and that's how I started. Oh. I, my first shop was Stan Electric. Oh, the, my first shop was Stan Electric, too. Get out, yeah. Yeah, it was, we were on uh, the South Broadway building. Oh, I, that's where I went, yeah. Yeah, I worked there for about a year. I was in there with a John. Yes. Wait, yeah. how the hell did we miss oh, each no, other no, on I'm that? Sorry, John. I'm wrong. That was a different one. I was. I know him, yeah. I know him. I don't remember who exactly was there. Dave was there. There was a couple of good guys. Carmine. I worked with I the Billy. Yes. He was there. A guy named Danny. I forget his last name. Uh, but yeah, a lot of guys. But in any case, that was my first shop, Stan Electric. They were in Pleasantville, New York, right? I never went to the shop, but I remember the general foreman <laughs> was a, a big, tall guy. He had, like, the handlebar mustache, white hair. Awesome uh, guy. Patrick. Yes. <laughs> Awesome person, <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> that was such a long time ago. Yeah, I get my stories crossed now. You, you realize how that's like over 20 some odd years ago. That's a scary thought. <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird because we started out, I joined the military when I was 17 and then got out and got in when I was 20. So I feel like it's the only thing I know. <laughs> and you, you're even younger. I didn't realize you got in at 18. Very good. Yeah. I, I got in at 18, and I think I was a mechanic by 24. <laughs> yes. It's like a good thing for people to get in younger. You know my son Tom just turned MIJ, 
and yes. he's actually working with Paulie and uh, Bob. So I'm gonna edit the people's last names so that way nobody uh, gets pissed that I name shouted them. He's over there and he's feeling like, oh, I don't know enough. I feel like there's so much, but I feel like we all went through that by the time we were fifth year, but we just had the tools to figure it out, right? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, and 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 he'll start to see that he adapts because after a while you come to realize that you really get sent blind. You don't know where you're going. You're just going in blind to a majority of these jobs. Even if you're with the shop for a long time, you're not just gonna do lights. You're not just gonna do uh, motors. You, you, it could be anything. Yeah, you so, can encounter. What do they say? Zero volts, the lightning bolts. Yeah, yeah. They work with everything. The last place I was at in New York, I was uh, doing cameras security cameras I, not something that I had done but not so involved like how I was then and at, at the time so it was nice to learn that yeah. so you always learn something new he'll adapt he'll get used to it it's just that the beginning fear that, that oh that, yeah it's over <laughs> eventually up until this point in your career what's the funniest story on the job that you can share didn't we go in around the same time I started December 1995 in the union I started in 98 I believe Okay, so in, in your over 20-year career, uh -huh. what would be your funniest job site story that you can share? Story, the funniest job site story I could share, I would say, I think the funniest we had, well, the funniest <laughs> job I had was at the racetrack with you guys. You that think happened, so? Actually, awesome. That, that, that was, and I had something funny happen to me, but I don't know if you were there, but I was the guy who took down the awning with the pickup truck because of the extension ladder was a... Uh, put in the back you never should put it in the back of the truck this way but it was standing upright kind of was john pete involved in that foolery no it was just me that <laughs> i take full responsibility for that one you know what the funny thing was i, I was new there and me and mike came on doily and, right yeah mike okay. doily and i saw that and in my head I said to myself, why are they putting that like that? Like, that's an accident waiting to happen. Then months later, it's always been left like that. And they call me and they say, hey, you got to run over here. So I'm driving aimlessly because I was on a night shift. So I'm driving this morning and the sun's coming up. And I just go through the where the awning is. I'm heading towards it. And I go, immediately it like hit me, but it was too late. Because all I heard was, boom. <gasps> Yes, I do remember that. I remember Richie R. Pissed about that. <laughs> so I took that down. And then the funny thing was, I went back to the shop. I called my sister. Guess what happened? And they already knew. They were like, oh, okay. So I left. And I went food shopping. As I'm going food shopping, because I had left the job, they're calling me. I didn't get the calls because where I was, I didn't get service. And they're like, you got to come back in. They want to drug test you. Remember that guy, Mike? Uh <laughs> I'm trying to remember the, the, the guy who was like the head guy of the maintenance crew. Oh, no, no, no. That was Victor. But Mike Victor. was a big wig for the, for the casino. So oh. he wanted to see me. and So I went to his office. I was like this little kid getting reprimanded. And Victor was with me. And I just stood there. And I was just looking. He was like, did you, did you hit the awning? I was like, well, yeah. What the fuck? I would be here. <laughs> here we are, sir. Here we are. <laughs> got tons of cameras around there you saw me step out so whatever but yeah i did it and uh he says were you drinking i says no i was not <laughs> he was like all right look man you, you don't look like you're on drugs or anything so he said we don't have to do the drug test so you can go about your business and you and, and you I, speak I, well I, for a hispanic guy so <laughs> yeah well for one of them Bronx boy hispanic puerto ricans you know so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever have anybody break your balls and say that to you? Wow, you you don't have an accent. <laughs> well, but you know, not well over here. You mean like in California? Any, yeah, well anywhere. Do you notice the well, difference? I, I yeah, some well, some people catch it, some people don't. I find it more here. Like here, I'm like targeted. Like they know <laughs> where are you from because you're not from here. <laughs> My mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not from here, buddy. I haven't had that too much, I guess. The story that you shared about the extension ladder over the top, wouldn't that be the most embarrassing story, or you find that the funniest? I find that absolutely hilarious. I thought it was pretty funny for some reason. I guess for me, I said to myself that that was right, and I should have corrected it probably. But I, you're new there, so I was like, I don't want to tell these guys anything. <laughs> and <that was laughs> and like, then you end up looking like the fool. <laughs> 
Right, and I'm the one, but it was just so funny how it happened because if you were with me at that moment, I would have probably looked at you with that face of horror as it was going to happen, like the second before, like I just realized, oh my God, I'm going to hit something. Your life flashes before your eyes, like, oh my God, this, yeah. this cush job is gone. Boom. This cush job, I'm not going to be working on nights anymore. Ever. <laughs> go out into the real world no. did you miss that one time when Pete was doing the wildest shit probably ever uh, inside the casino I, well I know I worked with him once and he, he was always doing wild stuff but he was always with your crew I, he came and visited once in a while but he was always with you guys in the days right yeah he used to call me the girl and I had to go with him one time to Indian Point he was sitting there with the screwdriver in a live panel and I'm behind him we were like in the warehouse of Indian Point so I go to grab a, a wooden 2x4 and I'm standing behind him it just so happened it was behind him he's making me nervous first of all he's not wearing a flash suit he's not wearing anything and he looks like he's trying to st stab the breakers. So he turns around and he goes, what are you doing, Les? <laughs> I go, uh, just in case you get hung up, I got you, buddy. I got you. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll just do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. When we were in the racetrack, he was up on the top of a, you know how high in some areas in the casino, the ladder maybe it was like a 12 foot or 14 foot ceiling so he brings in say a 10 footer he's up on the top and he's trying to pull there was this huge coil of wire that they had because the section wasn't ready but we prepped up and had the, probably i'm speculating about 25 30 cat sixes with like 300 feet of slack yeah. they're all yeah. up in it's heavy yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. he was up in there up on the very top and he's trying to go on the tippy toes. We're all working nearby because the area, the section that we were in was shut down. There was probably 20 fire alarm cables that were suspended up in the ceiling and they were riding probably around crotch length or whatever. Right, right. And it was a live casino. Everybody's in there. It's past nine o'clock when they have it open. And somehow he lost his balance and the ladder it was shaking from side to side then it, it went on its side so he's up there trying to hold himself up there between a sprinkler pipe and those fire alarm he's doing this whoa you know like this whole and the ladder goes flying to the side so me silvio a couple other guys we scrambled like a nascar pit crew to grab the ladder, put it back up there to get him up there. Richie, I, I thought he was going to deliver a baby. <laughs> he, told him, he told him as soon as he caught his footing, because it literally looked like he was like a scrambling on the uneven bars in an Olympic match or something like that. He was like, whoa. Right, right. <laughs> he gets down, wrong. Yes, he, <laughs> when he gets down, Richie goes, get your tools and get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was character. <laughs> he was so dangerous. He used to stand on top of slot machines, almost fell. I can't tell you how many times you feel like I'm gonna witness a, a, a death here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, I know he was like that, man. I tell you, that was an interesting guy right there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had some fun times over there. That was a nice job. That was a very uh, relaxing place <laughs> yeah we had the combination of everybody was good people and then they were like break chops but then you came in uh and we moved those slot machines like a bunch of gangbusters the guy that was working the money train he, yeah. he comes over to us one time obviously they're all wearing those jumpsuits with no pockets so nobody would steal that that money that they take out every night he comes over to us and he goes who are you guys so we explain we're, you know, union electricians. She's like, no fucking way. Uh -huh. He goes, I thought you were a bunch of fucking rednecks from upstate. He goes, you come in here like a bunch of gangbusters and break all these machines down, and none of them are alight. He's looking at me. He's like, you're just as fucking savage as the rest of them. I was like, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs>
Well, maintenance <laughs> gigs are, are always more relaxed now. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Uh, I, I do like them. They're nice. Good for a time and age. But I think if you're young and just getting in, that's not the place for you. <laughs> you need to get out. <laughs> yeah, you need to learn some shit. Would you say that the bridge debacle was considered your scariest job story, or do you got a different one to share? Um, I'd say that was the scariest. I don't know if I've told you, but when I got hired on there, we were the crew who um, started doing the uh, work on the bottom. So we were running like a lot of the pipe work, and it was six inch rigid Ocal. Oh. And we had to uh, pick our, it was a massive platform. If you could just maybe envision a 50 foot by 50 foot square, if, if, if I could say it, maybe even bigger, uh, actually probably bigger than that, maybe 80 by 80. It was a big platform. If you can envision like a big stage, handrails around it, it was an elevator. It was like a lift. So there was like six motors on each, uh, three and three on each side, I believe, or probably more than that. We had to lift ourselves from, in the morning from the water off of barges, uh, boat, all the way to the bottom of the bridge. So it was about 120 feet. And then you're working on that all day. You're just suspended in midair. You're and talking about the, the Mario Cuomo bridge that was built? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what you were asking me, correct? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure when someone's telling a bridge story, we didn't really right. say which yeah. one it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so they did name it the Mario Cuomo. First of all, I, when um, I left, it was still the Tap and Z, so I didn't know what, it was Mario Cuomo now. It's always going to be Tap and Z, bro. There's nobody that I know that goes, oh, let's call it the Mario Cuomo <laughs> bridge. No, it's the Tap and Z, bro. Everybody knows forever. It'll be right. Tap and Z. Right. Ma- <laughs> yeah, that's what Gary said. The reason, the, the worst part of it was just getting up there, because um, initially every day, every morning, we were picking ourselves from the bottom and going all the way up top. I was one of the operators, and Dennis was an operator. When you're first starting, this is hard because you got to uh, start on time with the guy ahead with the other operator. Because if not, then you're you're lifting so high that eventually you start getting on level. And then the, the motors start to jam. Mm. And sometimes you have to unjam them up while you're high, suspended in midair. And it's scary because you got to pop the brake. This is o- over the water. You're over the water, yeah. So if you're 60 feet, 80 feet in the air and you get jammed, you got to pop the brake, that clutch or whatever's on the motor. You got to get it out with a, with like a, a metal rod or something. And then it drops you a couple of inches. So it's scary, you know? <laughs> no matter how you look at it. That sounds like a Six Flags ride. You only got to work. Did you wear a life vest while you're wor- working all day? Yeah, you had to wear a life vest 100% of the time. You had to be uh, cha- um, tied off. And we had double yokes, so we had two ch- 100% tied off. Um, so after we got the hang of that, uh, Billy was our foreman. Oh, cool. So we, we got the hang of that, and, and then that was smooth sailing. But uh, landing it was a pain, too, because you had to send guys down. Uh, they had to walk down, and then get a boat to the barge and then guide us in because sometimes the boats would move and we'd have to position ourselves and if it was windy the lift would be swinging so they would kind of position us and land us so we, we kind of got a hang of that and then eventually the safety officer said you could leave the lift suspended for the week not the weekend so yeah. every Monday we would lift off and go to the top tie off then on Friday afternoon we would come down and land for the weekend so that was better it got less scarier I started doing that but it was pretty nice it, it was a nice job overall climbing eventually I had to climb climbing about sometimes you had to climb from the bottom to the top so that was like 400 feet climbing the tower and uh yeah that was interesting and, and it was good it was a nice job though so I, that's where I started running the six inch and then I wound up getting another job with uh, security how many six inch uh, runs did you have to make? Multiples? There was about six of them, I think. Six, six inch with 90s, and then it transitioned over to stainless steel six inch flex. Wow. Yeah, a lot of them were for um, uh, fiber optics, some were for uh, high voltage. Um, so uh, that's what we were doing. We were working alongside the linemen, local 1245. They had some of their guys there. Well, they were our guys, but they had with three of their guys on either side uh, working. So it was interesting. It was a nice job. A lot of activity, a lot of walking, a lot of driving. I, I, I lucked out. I was able to get a van, so I was able to drive a lot of the time. So it was cool. You mean drive from home to the job and then take the, the van? Oh, no, I'll just drive on it. So when I got to the okay. job site, it would take a van and drive onto the bridge. So that was nice. I didn't have to take boats after a while when the bridge was connected to land. It was pretty cool. What 
what time of the year did you have to do the work over the, the water? This wraps up part A on my discussion with Brian as he was tramping in California. He was just sharing a story about working on the Mario Cuomo Bridge that connects Westchester County to Rockland County, New York. To find part B, head back into the podcast platform of your choice and continue the discussion. This podcast has been split up into parts A, B, and C. So look for the next part according to where you left off. I thank you for listening this far into the podcast episode. For more information, head over to my website at www.constructiontales.com. I wish you a great day. Peace out, Cub Scout. This wraps up another episode on the Verbally Disastrous podcast that can be found on over 20 podcast platforms, including Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Pandora Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information, head over to our website at www.constructiontales.com. I thank you for listening and have a great day. This podcast is protected through the U.S. Copyright Office as well as the Writers Guild of America.